Hello. Uh, yeah, hi, doc, uh, Dr. Chandra. This is Surati. I can see you now in the, uh, the thing. So your health sequence precision, this thing, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, this is Surat from Art Intuition Center. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Yeah, I. Yeah, no, I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just admitting. Hi, can you Hi. hear me? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you for accepting the invitation to speak at this webinar. And uh, yeah, yes. thanks a lot for uh, on a Saturday morning. You can you join us? Not at all. I will see if I can change my yes. name in this thing. I ah, rename. Yeah, I think I had done it for something else. Yeah. Right, right. Okay. So. Maybe once we can also try sharing your screen so that uh, we know that there are no uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, host disabled participant screen share. Uh, one second. And make you the host. Okay. Yes, I can see the screen. Yeah, yeah. Works? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, works. Yeah. Works. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. All right. So that's. Uh... Yeah. So, uh, so actually, we'll begin by a short introduction where I'll just speak about the center, what work we are doing, and huh. uh, then we could uh, start with your uh, presentation. You, we usually take questions at the end and we ask. Uh, the audience to kind of uh, type in their uh, questions in the chat box. So, uh, so would you prefer that format or because usually interruptions in midway can kind of uh, yeah. uh, this thing. So we usually take questions at the end. So I hope uh, that is fine. That's that's absolutely fine. Yeah, especially yeah. when it's online. I think that's yeah, 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 yeah. I think in a in a face to face format. Yeah, I think uh, everything works when you you can like interrupt in between. But uh, online exactly. is a bit trickier. Right, so, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So how have uh, things been at your lab? Are things coming back to normal? Yeah, things are getting back. I think yeah. Yeah. all of us were, many of us were infected and yeah, yeah, to isolate. And I'm sure it's the same everywhere. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think since Feb, it's been a bit better. Hopefully, things exactly. will come back. Uh, right. Right. Long. We'll see very soon. <laughs> I yeah. know. That's yeah, true. Cool. Uh, so what is the time now? I'll uh, answer. Sure. Yeah, actually I heard I had heard this version of your presentation on YouTube and I was just browsing through something and I thought I thought it was really interesting. I think uh, we'll start now. Uh, good morning, everyone, for uh, joining us today on a Saturday morning to listen to our monthly webinar uh, series. So today uh, we have uh, Dr. Naga Suma Chandra from IASC who will be speaking about can biology be a predictive science. So before uh, I uh, get into introducing uh, Dr. Chandra and um, 
So I will just uh, briefly take a few minutes of your time to talk about our center and why we have been organizing uh, these webinar series for the past uh, almost two years now. So I just share my screen. Okay, so I'm Surat and I'm a senior research associate at the Center for Predictive Human Model Systems at Atal Incubation Center. And uh, this center was established uh, almost three years back uh, in collaboration with Humane Society International India. And the center was primarily established uh, to enable technologies in India that are based more on human biology uh, rather than uh, primarily relying on animal models for uh, biological information. And um, so when I mean by human relevant model systems, what, what do I mean? So uh, as we all know, um, uh, like biology has primarily relied on animal models um, since time immemorial because, and primarily that has been because of lack of uh, relevant model systems that could capture uh, the human biology. But in the past a few decades, several new model systems have been developed, uh, which are based on human stem cells or human biology and can generate uh, data that can capture the complexities or subtleties of human biology in a better way, such as uh, these include organoids, organoid chip, 3D engineer tissues or ex vivo cultures or complex uh, advanced non-invasive imaging tools, etc. So um, we have uh, quite a few options that have been developed in the past few decades. So our uh, center has been involved in how uh, in understanding and enabling these technologies in India. And uh, the way, um, The way uh, we have been doing it is our work is kind of branched into uh, four major areas. One is increasing awareness because uh, uh, the public uh, uh, the public awareness for what are the human relevant methodologies and what are the alternative methodologies is still quite uh, low in India, both uh, amongst researchers and general audiences. So uh, we have been having various uh, activities and uh, events to increase awareness for uh, these methodologies. This includes, uh, for example, popular articles, reviews, and this monthly webinar series is another example of that. Apart from this, we have uh, several education and training activities also. And uh, this year, we have also received, uh, we will be conducting the uh, first ever EMBO India lecture series, particularly in the area of microphysiological systems in India. And we'll be coming out with the details for that uh, very soon. Uh, we also were also involved in several policy initiatives where we conduct uh, multi-stakeholder roundtable meetings with government and regulatory bodies to again um, to take the recommendations that we provide into actionable outcomes. And we are also involved in several global collaborations to increase the knowledge base of um, these technologies. Uh, apart from this, we are also involved in funding where we recently uh, provided grants to two Indian scientists to develop an adverse outcome pathway in the field of cancer. And um, so that's also something which we're currently involved in. And the kind of roadmap that we see to, um, uh, to enable human relevant research in India is one uh, is if we could establish uh, center specific uh, centers of excellence to further develop and validate these methodologies where we can bring different kind of stakeholders together who are, who are uh, currently involved in developing various aspects of these technologies. Second is if we can enable connections between the technology developers and end users, for example, the pharma companies, uh, which would again help in uh, the translational aspect of these technologies. Third is a very important aspect, which is the even once you develop the technology, you need a regulatory approvals to kind of bring it into the pipeline drug discovery pipeline. So for that, uh, we aim to engage with the regulatory bodies during the initial stages of the technology development, so as to ease the process of regulatory approvals once uh, the technology is developed. And um, uh, globally, there have been several advances in these methodologies. So. Um, so we are also we would also like to enable more cross border collaboration for both a technology transfer and international funding. And uh, one of the aspects is uh, currently the supply chain in India for uh, for indigenously developing many of these technologies still needs to be enabled. That's also something that uh, we are working towards, and we would like to enable. So uh, we also have a quarterly newsletter, and I will just put the registration link in the chat box where we have. Uh, informational videos, opinion articles, all the latest uh, research that is happening in this field. 
and also grants and job opportunities in this field. So I'll put the um, registration link in the chat box so uh, you can uh, register for the newsletter, which will uh, which we release every uh, quarter. So yeah, so with this, uh, without my screen is stuck. Sorry. So yeah, so with this, I'll uh, stop and. Um, yeah, so I'll, um, I'll request um, one second. Sorry, my screen is still. Yeah, so uh, with this, I'll stop and um, introduce Dr. Nagasoma Chandra. So she is a professor at Indian Institute of Science. And uh, her major uh, interest in the lab is to understand genome-wide perturbations in several human diseases using multi-level modeling of biological systems and how to translate these insights into biomarker and drug discovery. And we are very pleased to have her in our, in our monthly webinar series. And I would now request uh, Dr. Chandra to please uh, start her presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Surat. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And I was very impressed to see the initiatives. I think much needed initiatives. Yeah, the congratulations. And uh, uh, thank you. So let, let me share my uh, presentation. Yeah, I hope it is uh, visible. Uh, yes, yes. One small uh, just point. If anyone wants to uh, ask any questions, please type in the chat box. We'll take all the questions in the end. And I would also request everyone to keep their um, mics uh, mute so that we don't have any interruptions during the talk. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I'm from the Department of uh, Biochemistry and also associated with uh, bioengineering. Uh, department bio uh, uh, BSSC biosystems and uh, engineering department at uh, IAC and also with uh, two startups health seek precision medicine at IAC campus as well as QBiome research in uh, IIT Chennai where we're using predictive models um, <clears throat> various computational approaches for uh, either medicine or biotechnology in both these things so I hope in the next hour I will tell you um, what you know whether you know I hope I will be able to help you answer the question, can biology be a predictive science? Um, and also tell you the, the journey, you know, how it has been, uh, you know, how the field is progressing and so on. To start with, I think it's good to reflect on biological design itself. You know, biological design, it's not really a design. So it's an outcome of a random tinkering process, which is uh, nothing but evolution. This in contrast to engineering objects, you know, like an aircraft or a computer chip or any uh, engineering object, uh, it, it's very different because these objects are built on purpose with a pre-designed blueprint and it go, goes precisely as per the initial design and uh, specifications and so on. So you know what the end product should be. But in biology, we are presented with the end product and we need to go backwards and figure out what the design has been or what the evolutionary design and the rationale and why some things are the way they are and so on. And then start using that knowledge for application. So that's the main challenge really. As if that's not enough, the scale and complexity is very, very high in biology. As you'll see, uh, you know, if you compare with uh, uh, physics or chemistry, you know, the number of elementary particles would be a handful number of elements in the periodic table are 100 plus, right? 115, whatever. Uh, number of uh, small molecule chemicals that are out there as building blocks in chemistry would also maybe in, in uh, you know, hundreds to thousands, depending on what you're looking at. Whereas the building blocks in biology are very different. First of all, the organization layers, as you will see, it goes all the way from, uh, uh, is my pointer visible? Um, yes, yes. Is my yes. Okay, great. Okay, fine. So if you go uh, backwards from biosphere, biosphere to ecosystem, all the way to an organism somewhere here, and organ system, organ. So we're all familiar with the hierarchy in biological systems. So at each layer of this hierarchy, the complexity is enormous. Right? 
So you will have anything uh, even as an underestimate 10 to the power seven species. And within each organism uh, in humans, you can have trillions of cells. Uh, excuse me, madam. Yes, madam photograph, photographs are not clear. It is very small, madam. I see. You, do you not see my full screen now? Yeah, no, uh, I think it's visible. Um, so I think we'll continue and then um, Nilis, I think you'll make the points which uh, you want to make. I think. Uh, I see, I see. Because I can see full screen here. So yeah, yeah, full, to... yeah, full screen is there, yeah. And is this uh, any, any better? Is this uh, better or, or you want me to continue? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Please continue. Yeah, it's fine. All right. Okay, okay, fine. Um, uh, so there are uh, trillions of cells in an organism and even with the uh, sophisticated uh, single cell sequencing data, the, the picture that you're seeing here, uh, you can clearly separate out uh, the cells, which means that they have their unique characteristics and so on. There are billions and trillions of processes that are happening at e each uh, second in a human body, for example, many biochemical reactions and uh, so on. So the number of players are many. The complexity comes in terms of the scale as well as in terms of the interactions among them. And even within one cell, if you look at the number of species of uh, proteins, when I say species here, number of types of proteins, it can be anywhere between 10 power three to 10 power five uh, proteins in a cell. And each one expressed to different levels. And the number of copies of each of these can be very different. And as if that's not enough, you also have different modifications on these protein molecules, like post-translational modifications of various kinds, complex formations and so on, which increase the number of species enormously. Right? So a phosphorylated protein is very different functionally from an unphosphorylated protein and so on. So the, the complexity is enormous and it is dynamic, it, that, which is why our systems are able to adapt to situations so quickly, whether we are hungry or thirsty or whether there is a an infection around, we overcome many, many things uh, uh, all the time. And it's because of this adaptation, you know, very rapid, dynamic, um, and yet very precise. You know, each time something happens, it is, it's happening very precisely, not in just in that individual, not in just that cell, but over generations and so on. You know, it's uh, carried over very precisely. If you look at the language of physics, you know, more like uh, equations which are very, you know, very clear what the what, uh, causes are and what the effects are and somewhat similar in uh, chemistry. There is a language of biology is more like this, what you see on the left hand side, a complex jungle of uh, things. And then if you want to answer a question of what happens if an EGF receptor gets phosphorylated, you, there is no straightforward answer. You will have to say if this, if that, or it's a long, lengthy um, a text has to be attached to that. In other words, it is context dependent. It's very, very highly dependent on the context, which uh, just talks about the complexity that is out there. I think my screen is stuck. Yeah. Fine. So, so you can ask questions in say physics, what happens if I drop a ball and you get really clear answers, which makes it very predictive, right? You know what time it will touch the ground with what impact and so on and so forth. And so in, even in chemistry, you know, to, uh, to a major extent, uh, you can ask questions such as what happens if you mix A and B under certain conditions and certain catalysts and so on, and you get a predictive answer. But in biology, it's not really the case. So it has been more observational than predictive because there are so many uncertainties and it's so context dependent and the context itself is very difficult to define. And therefore, traditionally, biology has been an observational science. Our observations have got more and more um, sophisticated, right? And more and more integrated with experimental uh, sophistication as well. But at the end of the day, we are still not predicting most of the time conventionally. Um, uh, so it has been an observational science. So it's more like stamp collection in biology. The stamp collection, of course, has been very important. You know, even though the flavor has changed from the days of the Darwin to what we currently see. So it is still, we are observing and recording. We're observing, recording. We're observing with a very set certain, uh, with a, 
specified uh, you know set of experiments and so on so we know the context is also what something we're observing and uh, record can we move from this observational kind of a setup to a predictive setup you know can we make biology a predictive science in fact that's the grand challenge uh, you know currently so why is prediction important i don't think i need to convince this uh, audience at all prediction is really important i mean when can you do prediction right you can make predictions when you understand the system very well and when you are able to make predictions then you are able to apply it to a variety of uh, contexts and you know you can convert that knowledge into technology basically that's why it's very important you know uh, to do to, to be able to make uh, predictions and now with the changing face of biology you do have uh, data coming in various ways and various kinds big data um, multiple types really so the challenge that lies today is in converting this data into interpreting them into models you know uh, into hypothesis maybe you generate hypothesis as compared to a hypothesis driven research in the past in biology where you started with a hypothesis based on prior knowledge of some sort or intuition or just putting various things together into your mental model and so on but today you can actually generate a variety of hypotheses and then knock out what doesn't hold and keep what holds and so on and then develop theories so converting this data into um, theories at the end of the day is uh, is a goal today and for the context of today's talk, I think the grand challenge is actually, can we predict the phenotype given the genome, genome being one of the most important sources of data, can we predict the genome to a phenome sort of predictions? Because there are multiple uh, challenges uh, in that, and, and, and you, you see there are, it's across time scales, across spatial scales and so on. But uh, I think there has been reasonable progress, which is what I uh, hope to show you. Right. Take a disease such as tuberculosis, which we've been working on uh, for quite some time. And for just reasons of convenience, I have picked examples where possible from my own laboratory. Um, but then there are many, many examples out there in literature. Okay. So tuberculosis, the moment you do a, a search for PubMed search or any literature search on tuberculosis, uh, you will find data of all of this kind. You know, it can be clinical data, or images like x-rays or microbiology data. You will find a large number of omics data today, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and so on. You'll also find information about uh, protein structures, a lot of information on immunology, and so on. So how, um, and biochemistry, obviously. So how far can we go with this data? How do we digest all of these things? You know, this appears as disparate data quite often. There is no connection between the pattern in the chest x-ray here that I see to the protein structures that I see on the right-hand side. You know, that there obviously is a connection, but we do not understand enough to draw a line and say if the sequence has changed uh, in a certain way, and therefore the structure has changed in a certain way, the, that's the cause for this specific pattern in this individual to have a granuloma with a certain boundary or something of that kind. You know, we're very far away from that. But the predictions are possible um, at, at uh, different levels, as uh, we will see as we go along. So where do we even begin? You know, how much sense can we make out of all of this data? Where do we begin? Right? So now modeling can be uh, carried out at multiple levels. Uh, so at one end of the spectrum, I think the traditional uh, one uh, previously is the more in the realm of theoretical biology. So people were looking at disease epidemiology, uh, even today, I think in the context of COVID, you must have heard a lot of these kind of models, uh, you know, even in uh, the news and uh, uh, public, publicly available articles everywhere. So that's at one level, okay? That's a uh, more like a top-down approach. You go to the other end of the spectrum, um, the most detailed level that is possible is looking at molecular components, you know, understanding sequences, structures, and what gives rise to the properties that you're seeing of any system that you're looking at. So this is at the other end of the spectrum. And at each one of these things, we do have approaches that are available, uh, which some of them we will see, which help us capture all of this data into a coherent model, 
of course, validate that uh, with um, looking for consistency, validate that experimentally where possible, and then develop that into a predictive model. So that's, that's when prediction is uh, possible. So uh, we will see some examples of uh, most of these layers as we go along. Um, so we, the, this end of the spectrum comes more into the realm of bioinformatics, you know, genomics, various types of data analysis. Bridging the two somewhere in between is systems biology, where it can take data from all of these ends, make large genome-wide models, and then give you the predictions. You know, again, we will see some of that as we go. There are a variety of modeling approaches that are available, again, depending on the question we have in mind. And depending on the data that we have available with us, we can choose one of these uh, in the interest of time. I won't go over uh, these in detail, but at one end of the spectrum, we have atomistic models where you're actually looking at the position of atoms. Um, uh, you know, there could be the tens of thousands of atoms that are out there in a protein molecule. It is possible to get the spatial, uh, uh, relative spatial uh, positions and orientations of these atoms uh, in a protein molecule and then infer something from that. At the other end, we do have uh, qualitative models where we can get associations and correlations and then just get some binary decisions of yes or no, go, no, go kind of thing at one other end of the spectrum. Of course, machine learning comes in um, uh, everywhere. So that can be used when a lot of data is there. Again, let's see some examples of that. So to start with, let's take a genome uh, like tuberculosis, again, it applies. Many things are common for uh, human genome as well, or uh, viral genome, or whatever. You know, it's, just, it's this is just an example. So, how much can I? How much can you predict from a genome sequence today? Right. So, uh, let's say once the genome sequence is there, um, genome sequence itself is compared to your book of life. Um, well, it, you know, you have uh, book uh, chapters, you have uh, paragraphs, there are sentences, there are words, uh, and so on. But the challenge that we have in front of us is that the book comes without any punctuation, and the book is not written, you know, in any comprehensible manner at all. Some things are from left to right, some things are from right to left. There are many, many letters that make no sense at all to us, you know, I'm talking about the uh, coding frames, you know, the translation frames, I'm talking about exons and talking about introns here. So that a large portion of the genome itself does not make any sense, but where it makes sense, uh, yeah, we need to understand uh, how to, in, you know, infer uh, information from uh, those things, how to extract information from them. But it is um, actually possible. In fact, what we can do get is uh, identify all the molecular components that are out there, get some function annotation, can even go as far as saying, you know, how does this pathogen evolve, especially if it is a virus and it's very important for that, looking at pathogen evolu evolution and also drug target and immunogenicity, which I will show you in a minute. So bioinformatics comes in very handy here to be able to, it, it, it provides a, uh, you know, a framework to integrate these various pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that you get in these you know, pieces themselves being the uh, data pieces that we get. Because the bioinformatics, the definitions are being rewritten and boundaries expanded constantly. And today it's possible to scale up from molecules to cells to whole organisms and yet retaining the full depth. And a large number of databases are available which help us, uh, you know, we can navigate. The computational methods have come up quite extensively over the years to be able to do these things. Now, as an example, you know, once you have a sequence, what can you do? You can actually infer function of that protein molecule without doing any experiments. So in a large number of cases, it has been true. And today this has become standard. It is not, uh, uh, it's not that novel anymore, but it has become a standard practice. So that uh, so much so that every biologist actually uses a tool called BLAST um, that has become a verb, uh, uh, not, in the, uh, not in the common English sense, but it's an acronym for a sequence alignment basically. So, uh, so once people are, uh, once we can do um, a BLAST search, you can actually place this protein molecule, the gene of uh, translated to your protein molecule in the context of all other things that we know, and then say, what is the function of this pro particular protein molecule? And in a number of cases, you get the function quite accurately. This is a picture of the function annotation of all 4,000 proteins that are there in the mycobacterial uh, tuberculosis genome. 
So each square stands for one protein and the coding, the, the, um, the, dis, the color stands for what functional category they belong to. So at one go, it is possible to get all of these kind of information today. We can also compare uh, organisms quite readily and then ask what are the set of genes that make genes and therefore gene products that make this particular organism so different from them. Take an example of Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. Both are cousins, but the manifestations are very different from each other. You know, TB is a very different disease from leprosy. So if I want to ask a question, what is it that is there in this TB genome that makes it so specific to, to allow the manifestation as TB and vice versa? Now, at one go, these kind of comparisons are possible. What you're seeing here is a whole genome alignment of M. leprae on one axis and TB on the other axis uh, carried out at two different stringency levels. Um, that depends on the question that you're asking. And then asking um, and then identifying or predicting those genes which are so different in mycobacterium tuberculosis as compared to leprae, which must be the, you know, which can be easily associated with the man differences in their manifestations. So, okay. So you can take this understanding to another level. So remember I talked about the hierarchy and organization of biological systems. Now the sequences tell us some uh, amount of information, but th the actual workhorses are the three-dimensional structures of protein molecules. So today it is possible to predict sequence to structure in a large number of cases. In fact, um, uh, so much so that I think people are uh, uh, beginning to accept it uh, quite well uh, these days. You know, conventionally, prediction and biology did not go together at all. People have been very skeptical about uh, predictions because it was still developing and so on. But the, the world has changed today. And in fact, uh, the, you know, most people would have heard about the deep minds alpha fold uh, success with alpha fold. Uh, although there may still be some gaps, but a large number of protein molecules and a number of species have been uh, predicted. Um, the, and I think it's a matter of time before they get the entire uh, structures right. So it's not just individual structures. Now you want to look at how they form complexes, how do they, how do they lead to a pathway or a signal transduction process, and uh, how do they uh, achieve the end goal and uh, the orchestration of all of them into what life is all about. Right? So you can get, you, there are predictive models of sequence to structure, as you will see one of our examples from long ago uh, of a RECK protein um, out there from TB that was predicted and later verified by X-ray crystallography. And this protein forms filaments, a higher order organization like this, which you see in this figure. Again, comparison of that and the colors that you see actually reflect the charge distribution on these assemblies and therefore, the consequences of this charge uh, uh, assemblies in terms of their function, whether they aggregate, whether they bind to DNA, uh, you know, when, how, and so on, those kind of questions. And this can be placed in the context of other molecules of, uh, you know, which have the same form or which are uh, neighbors in the structure space or uh, evolutionarily uh, related proteins, cousins of some kind you can place that and then ask number of questions about is the skeleton the same, are the additional features different and so on. And what is the effect of that? Do you see differences in molecular recognition? And that's the starting point for functional differences that you see, either similarities or differences that you see as you go along. So that's what uh, these pictures are actually reflecting. And this has been taken quite well into predicting what kind of uh, you know, uh, molecular recognition properties does it have? So what you see on the left-hand side is a protein molecule binding to a ligand here. I think this is uh, C. allidase binding to neuraminic uh, acid out here. And you can get very precise answers about the intermolecular energies, the affinities, and so on and so forth. And you can use that for applications for searching the space available in this binding pocket out here to design a ligand and to optimize a ligand. So the, the, these applications are, I think, used quite commonly. These predictions are used in drug discovery quite often. An example from uh, my lab, recent example is an antimicrobial peptide design using structures, instru structural information uh, combined with machine learning to predict an antimicrobial peptide that is better than 
cholestin and tigicycline and the, for the treatment of uh, bacterial infections in ICUs. So that's um, an example. Of course, a number of computational models and algorithms have come about. And again, these are examples from my lab uh, over a period of time uh, where you can look at binding pockets, compare them, align binding pockets, predict which is the most influential by a residue for holding on to a ligand. You know, uh, can we do um, computational uh, uh, alanine scanning, mutagenesis, and uh, so on? You know, these type of uh, things that are leading to understanding protein structure recognition and interrogation purely through uh, methods of this kind, and which leads to applications in drug discovery. Um, the, of course, I don't have the time to talk about each one of them in detail, but again, these are all examples from our work from various uh, um, over the time. Uh, so this goes into predicting drug targets, target identification, combination targets, or polypharmacology as a uh, concept, or, uh, you know, re on the drug front, drug repurposing, drug rescue in terms of resistance, predicting adverse effects, you know, drug safety profile, cancer drug resistance, and so on. So the number of uh, the understanding at the level of sequences and structures can take us into all of these things, which are very useful for uh, either as fundamental understanding for drug discovery or applications you know, at uh, the end of the spectrum. Okay, but then what is missing? Now, you know, with all of these, the predictability is pretty high, but there's still a huge chunk that is missing. And that's because we are looking at individual protein molecules or the molecular components that are out there from a reductionist view. Now, the, uh, what I mean is, you know, it, you know, the conventional belief has been that if you understand one protein in its entirety, you're able to take the knowledge from that, the function from that to the whole uh, system that it is associated with. But again, this is not difficult to convince the audience at all. So it's just the limitation in terms of how far we could go was holding us back. But today the world has changed. And you're all familiar with this uh, elephant in the blind man kind of a uh, cartoon out here where if you don't see the entire thing, you strongly believe it's a fan or a spear or a wall or uh, so on and so forth. In fact, what the genome sequence or the genomics, omics as a whole, has been telling us is it is giving us these individual parts, basically. But it does not tell us, of course, the annotation is the job of a bioinformatics uh, exercise along with individual molecular biology and biochemistry experiments that uh, go along with it. But if, if the, the, when we get a blueprint, uh, I mean, there is no blueprint to say, put piece number nine next to 12 or 12 next to 13 and so on. So that assembly um, guide is not there. You don't even have a way of... Uh, uh, even color coding itself is a challenge, but assuming that that is done, now the next challenge is to integrate them into a whole. And why is integration important? You know, you, you really don't know what you're looking at until you assemble them and get a coherent framework for what we are looking at. I mean, the, the details are still missing in this framework, but the frame, framework is a starting point for us to see where to put all things together. So it's systems biology really that integrates these things into a coherent framework the omics by itself gives a parts catalog, but you need to start putting them together, which by no means is a <laughs> Sorry, is there a question now? No. Oh, I think someone unmuted by mistake. Yes. No problem. Yeah, yeah. So is systems biology really a new discipline, right? I mean, to define the systems biology is pretty simple. It just means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And one of the statements that I have been very uh, fond of for a long time is, uh, you know, uh, part of the definition of systems biology is to understand how system properties emerge, the pluralism of causes and effects in biological networks, uh, which is better ad addressed by uh, quantitative measures, observing through quantitative measures. And uh, 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 so, so the idea is here, the pluralism of causes and effects, which, because it's a complex system. And systems thinking is really not new to biology at all. The reason why we depend more on a mouse model as compared to in vitro models itself stands testimony to such thinking uh, because we are using the mouse as a, a systems model, but the difference is that we don't understand what is happening in the mouse entirely, right? So systems biology differs from this concept 
because it is not a black box, whereas the conventional ones, we may inject something into the mouse and get a readout. We may make it much, much more sophisticated and have a transgenic mouse where only one gene is knocked out and then get the results. But still, there is a black box out there because we're not able to explain why that happens all the time, right? In certain situations, yes, but not all the time. Really. The other end of uh, the spectrum again, uh, systems biology differs from um, the extreme levels of abstraction that people have been using. I mean, many of you may be familiar with the spherical cow joke goes out there. So uh, extreme levels of abstraction. Uh, it differs from that because um, systems biology actually builds the whole system brick by brick with retail data that is available and uh, puts this assembly guide out here, you know, gets a framework to start assembling and then integrates it in uh, qualitative, quantitative, semi-quantitative, whatever fashion that is possible. So it differs from both of these things, which is uh, excellent. So it actually departs from the common view in drug discovery of single target, one drug, lone therapeutic indication. And the way it's generally practiced is you have uh, typically high throughput data or at least un genome wide data of various kinds. And that's um, combined with the, you know, the cellular and molecular interaction knowledge that is available from literature or from decades of research and then up to convert it into some sort of a mathematical uh, model, which is tractable through computational uh, methods. So simulation analysis is typically a uh, part of it. Once this model is validated, it becomes predictive. It combines uh, informatics, computational science, mathematics, and biology. So uh, once it becomes, uh, it's verified and validated, it becomes predictive and can be used for a variety of situations. Um, by changing what hap what if type of questions can be answered. What if there is a polymorphism in a given gene? What if there is excess production because a biochemical pathway is upregulated, right? And what if there are two molecules competing with each other like a drug and a, a natural ligand? These type of questions can be answered by these models, okay? So in reality, what we have is a huge complex network where each circle here stands for maybe a protein molecule, the connections stand for a protein-protein interactions, somewhat like a, a, a jungle of road networks, but only much, much more complex uh, than that, really. And there are a number of methods that are available for us to ask, uh, uh, you know, for us to address complex questions. And again, what you're seeing here is a metabolic network, a standard metabolic network, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, underrepresented, honestly, despite the, despite the clutter that you see on the screen, because each one here you may be familiar with stands for a metabolite and a conversion to another metabolite. These kind of reactions go on all the time. Can we capture this entire knowledge into a single model and ask questions, you know, about what happens if we knock out this particular thing, right? One particular gene, or should we knock out two genes? You know, what, what's the best way to achieve the result that we want? So then it becomes predictive. So when we are able to do such a thing, it becomes predictive. In fact, there are methods. So this is an example of uh, at, uh, an approach called flux balance analysis. So this is again for mycobacterium tuberculosis. So you can capture the entire thing into your model. You can also integrate it today with, say, proteomics data or transcriptomics data to make it very context specific. And then, say, if I give a certain amount of food, this is a bacteria again. If you uh, give a certain amount of food, uh, is the bacteria able to eat that food and how fast and what is it able to make its biomass and so on? And for me to kill or think of kill, uh, strategies to kill this bacteria, what is it that we should do? You know, can we do a systematic exercise of knocking off each one of these genes or other parameters that are out there and then identify which genes are essential? So if I knock off these genes out here, they are all essential to the system and no biomass is made. The uh, y-axis here is the biomass. Whereas knocking off these genes is not making any much uh, significant difference. And these are somewhere in between. And that understanding you can get in the form of distribution of fluxes across pathways and now these genes, which are totally essential for the bacteria to survive or for that to make a specific uh, product like a cell wall product or whatever is um, important for me in understanding how to uh, you know, identify drug targets, 
uh, to think of strategies, even for whether it's for diagnosis or for targets, it becomes very important. So uh, quite some years ago, we put some of these things together into your target identification pipeline. So several layers, a systems biology layer, a whole genome comparison layer, a structural biology layer out there, and then we're out um, you know, addressing uh, aspects of specificity, selectivity, safety, and so on, and then end up with predicting high confidence drug targets. And many of them are actually known drug targets, and many of them are new ones that are being pursued over the years. Okay. So moving to another type of prediction. Now this is on the host side. That was on the pathogen side, this is on the host side. So if I start looking at the host activate, uh, no, host response to TB, can we say who, you know, among individuals with latent tuberculosis, can we get some prognostic prediction as to say who is likely to actually switch over to reactivated TB? So first of all, latent tuberculosis comes from an initial infection, but it is well contained in the host, and then um, the, it, it remains dormant for their lifetime uh, uh, quite often. But in some situations, it becomes reactive. It, the infection comes back, but not all individuals come back to that. Can we do that? You know, can we understand why do some people with latent TB progress to active TB and so on? So the information we used here was uh, whole blood transcriptomes from several individuals uh, data set that was available. And then using our network modeling strategies, try to see are there differences that are uh, uh, there between them. And what this led us to do uh, was to subtype these individuals. What you see here below, C4, C5, C7, and C9, and so on, are various subtypes. And what you're seeing in the figure here are pathway fluxes. These are all immune response pathways. And the color indicates whether it's on or off or how much response through which pathway is going on. That is what you're actually seeing here. Based on, it's somewhat like a barcode. So if this particular barcode individual CC actually were much more prone to getting reactivated than others. And we uh, identify that with uh, a very high statistical significance out there. So what this tells us is we can identify them early. So we know what is happening years before they get reactivated. So more monitoring is possible and more intervention can be it, uh, possible. It can be actionable at the end of the day. So likewise, not just for tuberculosis, you can also do that for several um, other pathogens, viral infections. This is H1N1. You can do that for COVID as well and uh, any, any viral infection for that matter. <coughs> Consider host as a system, pathogen as a system, and the influence of environment on both these systems and how they integrate the system of systems basically inter interact with each other and ask several questions. Again, one example, a number of things can be done. This is just one example of T-cell antigenicity prediction. Again, you see a heat map in what this, uh, some of them are the strains of the virus. Some of them, uh, the one column is uh, different uh, populations, different ethnicities, which means different um, genetic backgrounds basically. What varies among all these genetic backgrounds are the HLA alleles, HLA class 1 alleles. And if HLA class 1 allele is ABC something, then their response to this pathogen is different from that of the other uh, group of people who have a different HLA genotype. And this prediction of antigenicity can happen purely from the sequence of a given virus. That's... Uh, of the methods have been standardized now and uh, verified, so it's become a predictive model. Epitope prediction has become quite standard. How far can you take that? That's the question. No, if you can understand the anti the host response to this antigenicity that's out there of this particular virus strain, let us say Omicron or was the previous Delta or whatever, you know, if it is COVID, then can we predict what sort of immune response an individual can mount? And can we also predict what kind of a um, susceptibility profile we will see in individuals? So that's the kind of plot that you're seeing here. Again, it's a few years old uh, uh, modeling study, much before uh, COVID came into existence. What you are seeing is um, these are uh, this ethnic groups on one axis, pathogenic strains, different strains of the same virus on the other axis. And the height of the bar is telling you how much immune response can be mounted. The lower the bar, it's a sorted plot, so it's easy to see. The lower the bar, the more the susceptibility to disease. And some populations are much more susceptible to the others. Some strains are actually much more 
um, you know, uh, virulent than the others. And this has been consistent with the data that it has been there. You can take this further, starting from the detailed uh, knowledge of the protein structures of HLA molecules and how they bind to these T cell antigens from the virus. You can go all the way to the predicting disease spread and uh, making uh, trees of this kind by overlaying this uh, data of this sort on a social network of how people interact with each other, with what frequency and so on and so forth, and a disease spread and identifying super spreaders and so on. So that's, that's theoretically possible, of course, and to come to practice, it will take some uh, uh, much more work to be done. Okay, so now very quickly switching over to um, uh, the applications of systems biology in precision medicine. Okay? So this has been a new paradigm shift in treatment. Again, uh, it moves away from the one size fits all uh, approach um, to, uh, with, uh, you know, if you want to address all of these issues that you see on the right hand side, this is susceptibility at an individual level. Can we address that? Can we get biomarkers and uh, precision diagnosis, which is what we are uh, uh, pursuing? Uh, can we get disease staging, the disease prognosis? Uh, everything is based on understanding the precise molecular components that lead somebody to a given, uh, you know, that, that is associated with the pathology that's out there in that individual. Can we get patient subtyping? Some of these things are very well known in diseases like uh, breast cancer, you know, who should be given Herceptin and who should not be given. People by, uh, have been looking at a given polymorphism, you know, a known, well-known polymorphism in one of the genes. You sequence the gene, see if there is a polymorphism and then say, yes, they, they should be given this drug or not given that drug. But we can move over from looking at polymorphisms to looking at the gene expression profiles or the proteome profiles where, where applicable, and then trying to understand what is the effect of this polymorphism. So you can take it to your next level and the data for that is available much more easily at times. And analysis of that data, which is the key challenge out there, can lead us to looking at patient subtyping and even optimal treatment strategy and so on. Okay. Um, types of data that we make use of here, you know, is uh, transcriptome data quite uh, extensively. Again, this is of host response to tuberculosis. So with the agnostically, without even knowing who is a healthy person who is infected with TB or who has been cured of TB, if you just give this data, this is transcriptome data, each row here is a gene expression of one gene and each column is an individual, right? So you just put it together the, and do clustering computationally. And you see that all the healthy people bunch up together and all the people with active TB bunch up separately. And those who are treated over a time point of say two months or 12 months actually are separate too. You know, they form distinct clusters and the 12 month one turns out to be much closer to uh, healthy controls than the two month. So it's a fantastic amount of information. So using some of these things and uh, uh, in-house developed uh, algorithms. So we have recently predicted non-responders to TB treatment. Okay, again, this is actual patient data that we collected from a local hospital here. Each column is one patient monitored over a time point of say week zero at the time of diagnosis to month 12. And the colors tell you who is a good responder, green is good and red is uh, poor and yellow is somewhere in between. And that correlates pretty well with the gold standards and the clinical data out there. So much so that it, it's become a, it is, it can be made into a predictive model now to say that at time point uh, at week two, if these are the characteristics, can you pre predict prognosis to treatment? And therefore, if they're likely to be poor responders, can we switch them over to second line therapies early on? No, that's the question that they are actually asking. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think I don't have time to go over uh, in detail. Uh, one can also do, this is a classical um, kind of a study by, um, uh, from literature, uh, classification of patients using multiple kind of things. Like I said, I mentioned that the mutations and polymorphisms are, is what people have been, con uh, uh, been looking at for a while. But from that, we can now go over to the transcriptome data as well. You can look at amplification, copy number status, in addition to whether it's a driver mutation, whether it's a missense mutation or truncation and so on, and classify people, and, uh, which you can use for stratification. You no, know, you can use it for 
looking at whether this group is likely to have a very uh, severe disease or are they likely to be uh, you know, not so severe? Are they likely to progress into stage four very quickly? Are they fast progressors or slow progressors? So the moment you can do this kind of uh, uh, classification, so you're not only looking at the entire, uh, uh, you know, why it's become predictive is because you're not only looking at the uh, comprehensive coverage of the individual's molecular components and how they interact with each other. You're also placing that in the context of all other patients that are out there. And some generalizations are possible when two of them are similar to each other and so on. So it is comprehensive coverage, deep data, plus contextualizing and generalizing. So these are the four things that are making it untimely. Of course, you know, in a short period of time, if you can do that, it's becoming predictive and it is becoming uh, a key, um, uh, you know, consideration for translation into the clinic. So this is one of the examples that I'm quite fond of because it shows it's a, it shows a futuristic application of how far we can take our predictive modeling this is again from uh, literature. So this is to say, what is the order in which drugs should be given? First of all, combination of drugs, which combination can be given? This is for uh, breast cancer again. So there's drug A and drug B, erlotinib and doxorubicin, which are given. But the order in which it is given, it, it is not random at all. It should depend on the underlying pathophysiology. So here it says the progressive rewiring that happens in a signaling network over time, following EGF receptor inhibition using erlotinib, it, this leaves triple negative breast tumors vulnerable to a second later hit. So a new vulnerability that arises because of this can then be treated with a second drug called doxorubicin, which is a DNA damaging drug. And the order makes a difference and therefore timing makes a difference. You give drug A first, and then drug B after half an hour or one hour, then that's much more different than giving drug B and drug A together or drug B first and drug A. So tumor targeting, this is, these are precision strategies that can be developed with prior knowledge of uh, the signaling networks and so on. So this is, okay. So with, uh, but quite often we don't have such mechanistic models that are available to us, but there is a lot of data that is available. Of course, what comes into um, our rescue or all the machine learning approaches, even without the knowledge of the underlying pathophysiology or the mechanisms, <coughs> it is possible if there is a lot of data to train them appropriately pardon me, and uh, get <coughs> decision boundaries out here <coughs> to classify who is healthy and who is disease or <coughs> who is a responder, who is a non-responder and so on. So, which is <coughs> taking us towards uh, <coughs> virtual uh, physiology, patient modeling, precision diagnosis, and personalized therapy, which should not be too far into the future. And I think we all have <coughs> all the ingredients today for this. <coughs> we just need to go ahead and make that actually happen. Yeah. Thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Chandra, for the, the amazing talk and great insights that you gave. Uh, so we'll uh, take the questions now. If uh, anyone has any questions, please uh, type in the chat box. Uh, so uh, right now, I'll just uh, read out uh, the questions which are there in the chat box um, so, uh, so that everyone can... Can you hear it? So the first question is uh, from Abhishek, and uh, they're asking, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I have a few doubts related to subtyping of patients using transcriptome. So the first question is, uh, isn't subtyping using uh, the trans... Sorry. One second. Yeah, isn't subtyping using transcriptome dependent on number of patient samples you get? And will the signature change upon increase in the number of samples? Right, it's a, it's a good question, quite relevant, <clears throat> but it doesn't have to be that. Uh, that, that. That doesn't have to be the case. If you are purely dependent on um, statistics that you get from transcriptome data, then you have to depend on numbers. So the more the better. 
And because uh, there is natural variability, heterogeneity is pretty high in this type of data that uh, becomes important. But if you are combining um, the, uh, the combining transcriptome data with some biological relevance, you know, such as with network models or any other kind of uh, process models that you are looking at, then you don't need to necessarily depend on large numbers. We have, I think the first signature that we predicted, which I didn't have time to talk about today, which is for diagnosing uh, pulmonary tuberculosis based on post response to TB. Our signature was made just with three samples. We tested them on thousands later on, but it was just done with three. So it depends on what you're actually trying to capture from that thing. So if you go uh, in, a, in a purely data-driven fashion, yes, numbers will become important. But if you combine biology and data, then uh, numbers are uh, less important. Uh, they're also asking another question where uh, transcriptome itself is uh, very dynamic. It may vary from based on points of infection, age of patient, etc. So how well is the transcriptome representative of uh, this? Transcriptomes are extremely uh, representative of the condition. Of course, they're dynamic. They do change. But there are certain genes and certain processes that remain throughout uh, the infection period. The challenge is in identifying those, which is why I think just, uh, you know, biology agnostic, but data driven approaches fail sometimes because of this reason, right? Uh, then you will need to have large numbers where uh, the model becomes uh, very good, but you, you have to choose, you have to combine domain knowledge with that to understand that. So once you have got so, some of these uh, genes out, then it becomes very easy to understand what's going, going on, right? In fact, I have published a paper on this topic. I can send it to you if you like. It's in uh, NPJ Systems Biology, I think, in 2017, which shows that uh, it, it's somewhat like, oh, you know, looking at traffic jam patterns in a variety of situations. And uh, the, our transcriptomes are compared to each pattern, basically. And different triggers can result in the same traffic jam. Right? And different changes in individuals can result in the same disease, which is why you will see variability. But despite that, there is a common uh, portion where there is a jam and there's a common uh, molecular subnetwork where there are perturbations in, uh, say, in a disease like tuberculosis. So the commonalities, despite the differences. Uh, so next question is from Sandra. So Sandra uh, is from European Commission Joint Research uh, Center. And uh, she is asking a very inspiring talk. I worked uh, 30 years in toxicology, but still for most work in the regulatory field models and methods are still a reductionist prediction. We have lots of in vitro and in silico tools, but are considered too complex to be used for personalized uh, toxicology. When do you see and how do you see a real breakthrough in personalized technology for better looking at adverse effects of chemicals, botanicals, food, and uh, feed systems, nutraceuticals, food added, added additives, et cetera, embracing uh, human-based models and methods similar as your tuberculosis work. Right, right. Uh, so, I, so I agree that uh, predicting toxicology is much, much more harder than predicting one desired effect, a pharmacological effect of a drug molecule, because again, it is the plurality out there, a number of causes for uh, toxic effects, but some of them we can predict, I think we do have methods and I think we did publish something uh, quite some time ago about um, uh, you know, a machine learning approach to look at uh, adverse effects of a uh, uh, set of drugs really. So there are models that we can, um, we can use our uh, you know, combining the systems biology approaches as well as deep models such as structure-based, you know, physics-based models, these are structural models. And then I think it becomes predictive. So there are, I don't think there are many um, tools that are readily available, but uh, I think individual cases, one can look at them uh, and, and then make some progress in that direction. I think we are ready in other words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, Dr. Radha is asking, having gathered gene expression data, how good have they been in actual predictions? Oh, pretty good. That's what we compare with uh, all the time. So these are um, validated experimentally as well. You can get, you uh, know, uh, it, it avoids preclinical models, more importantly, you know, when you go to human um, patients and then get blood samples from them, get transcriptomes, and then go back and then make predictions out of that, you're bypassing all the preclinical models uh, uh, that one would otherwise do. And the phenotype prediction is uh, has been pretty good. I mean, there are standard ways of 
verifying this, validating either by checking the gene expression itself again or by looking at the association with the phenotype. In fact, we have uh, recently done that for discriminating, let's say, viral and bacterial infections in blood samples. You know, can we say, should somebody be, be given an antibiotic or not given an antibiotic if it is a viral infection, right? So there are uh, predictions which are verified from these type of uh, studies. Uh, next question, uh, Dr. Kalyan Gayan is asking, uh, thank you for the interesting talk. What are the machine learning approaches for drug discovery or phenotype prediction? It depends on what aspect of drug discovery we are uh, looking at. If uh, we want to say predict the structure of a target protein, I think neural networks are used of various kinds today in a variety of things. But if it is transcriptome data, people use uh, support vector machines, random forests, or uh, any other kind of, um, it depends on what, what you're uh, actually looking at. You know, I don't think there is a standard formula for that. <clears throat> so it depends on the data, the quality of data, and the question we are actually asking. Uh, next question is uh, from one second. Uh, Nisha Venu Gopal, uh, she is from India, uh, Indo US Organization for Rare Diseases. She is asking, could you comment on the feasibility of using predictive models to help patients with undiagnosed diseases and also for clinically unknown genetic variants? We, um, th this is still, uh, you know, in the research phase. It is not ready for, say, deploying or even claiming that it is possible. But there are uh, some tools, especially if you have omics data. And there's some tools or some ideas that uh, you know one is uh, we're working on actually, and several others as well, where you can put them together and start looking at even in rare diseases or undiagnosed conditions uh, to place them in the context of what is known already. I think that should be possible. Yeah. Hmm. Right, but of course, all of this takes a, a long time before we can claim that we've reached the stage uh, as with other aspects. But it is certainly possible to start looking at these things now. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vijay is asking, uh, is it uh, adverse reactions to lipid-based vaccines? Can these be predicted using uh, these methods? Adverse reactions can be predicted to anything if you have uh, unbiased data. Again, I think the best data that we can think of is transcriptome data. So you, the, the key challenge then is to collect such data in the correct conditions. So the uh, genotypes that we obtain here must be done properly. The groups, study groups must be very carefully designed and at the same time point to reduce all the biases that can come. And then it is possible irrespective of whether it is a, say, a natural compound or a, an Ayurvedic cocktail or whether it is um, a vaccine um, formulation of the kind that you're asking, it, it should be possible to do that. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Abhiru Gupta has his hand raised. Do uh, you want to ask a question? Hello, can you hear us? I think uh, we are not able to reach him. Uh, anyways, I would ask if anyone has questions, please uh, write them in the chat box just for uh, ease of things because it's easier to go through them. Uh, yeah, so we'll, uh, there's another question uh, by Devpri. Uh, they're asking, thanks for the amazing talk, ma'am. I have extensively worked with structure-based drug design in my PhD project. I would like to ask uh, what new things can be integrated alongside to make it better or more validated in terms of being predictive? Right, okay. So first of all, are we looking at the right target? I think that can be uh, done. And once the target is taken and uh, is uh, structure-based methods are good at predicting the ligand, now you can also look at whether this lead compound that has been predicted is good in terms of uh, uh, its profile, the system's pharmacology that one can uh, start predicting. Right? So uh, from a reductionist point of view, the target and the ligand has been predicted very well. But what does the ligand do in addition to binding to that target and either inhibiting or activating it or whatever? Does it have other roles? Is what one can look at from a systems biology approach. I hope that answered your question. Yes, we just have a few comments uh, by people who are thanking you for the great lecture by Sivakumar Muthusamy. And uh, yeah, so 
I do there see are... uh, one question by Dr. Pankaj, who says, predicting each individual is acting against nature. I didn't really understand the question. Would you like to elaborate, Dr. Pankaj? Wait, nothing to act against nature here. I did not understand. Yes, that would, uh... Question is, uh, that is predicting each individual by acting against nature. Is it good for any living being? No, no, no. What is acting against nature? I didn't quite catch that. Hmm. That the data collection for each individual data collecting and by the basis of that predicting uh, the future for any individual human being. Is it good for the nature or not? That uh, I want to know. I see. I, I did not honestly understand that question, but then this is really not acting against nature in any form. Uh, me. Okay, so what we are trying to do is for the benefit of uh, individuals. I mean, what the field is doing, you know, not just uh, one person here. So we are trying to get predictive models so that we can use it in applications. I did not talk about the biotechnology applications here. So it talked about the health because that was of interest. Uh, so you, you do have predictive models that are useful for fundamental understanding of science, applications in say biotechnology, agriculture, whatever, and also in medicine. So that's for the benefit of the living beings. I know that's my simple understanding. Okay. Thank you. That's it. In terms of, uh, there are no more questions. We'll uh, kind of end here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chandra, for the very great talk and also amazing interaction afterwards. And uh, we'll also be posting the YouTube uh, link of this recorded session on uh, this thing on our AIC YouTube channel for everyone who wants to kind of revisit some of the insights that we have kind of gone through. Uh, so just one last thing I would, uh, I'll be po I'm posting the registration link for our uh, CPHMS newsletter. So if anyone wants to register for our quarterly newsletter, please um, uh, do so. And uh, we, this month we've had the third version of the newsletter also out, uh, just out. So can please uh, register for that. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank everyone for uh, their patience for staying with us on a Saturday morning for this long and sticking till the end. And uh, and for the great questions all the participants also raised. So thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you next month again in our webinars. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Thank you. Thank you, Surat. And thanks, everybody.